Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. And by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday, until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash ham nation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 277, December 7th, 2016. Tom Gallagher, the CEO of the ARRL, is our special guest. Good evening, everybody. It's K9EID, and you're watching Ham Nation, a program about ham radio. And boy, we have we got some really good stuff tonight. But before we get too far, let's see who all's here. Uh, I think Gordo is there from... Costa Mesa, how you doing, Gordo? I'm, I'm fine, Bob, and I'm uh, getting all ready for the big 10-meter contest, the ARRL-sponsored contest this weekend. So we'll hear some of our chat room and others on 10 meters, and I'm sure you'll be there as well. Back to you, Bob. I will. Got a lot of technician friends that'll be there for sure. George, how are you doing? You okay? Yeah, I'm doing fine, Bob. It's uh, about to turn cold here, and... Well, I, I had a little fiasco getting to a transmitter site today, but we'll talk about that a little later. Okay. Well, I, I have, before we get to our guest, and we're so honored to have our guest tonight, I have a public service announcement that Sarah and I thought we might tell you. At 10 o'clock this morning, actually it's about 10.45, I had a full-blown colonoscopy. So for all you people that say, oh, boy, that's going to hurt, and it's awful, and I shouldn't do it, and I'll be down for three. No, heck, we went and had lunch afterwards and everything. It, this is my, um, let's see, I think the fourth one I've had. I get them every five years, and I'm just telling everybody, please, if you've never done it, please do it, especially if you're over 50 years old. There's nothing to it. They used to have all this stuff you had to drink. That was terrible. But not anymore. They've got just about that much. You drink that twice and a couple of glasses of water. So there you go. So I wanted to let you know about that. So let's see. Let me get on here. Um, ooh, I just dropped my video. Am I still okay with you, Brian? You are. You're, you're good. You just froze for a moment. So No problem. Well, tonight we're very honored to bring to our show the new CEO of the American Radio League, Tom Gallagher. And Tom, welcome to this great fun program. We appreciate you being here. Gordon, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, Bob and Gordon, thank you both for, for having me on. I was hoping your standards would be higher, but I'll take it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're fine with that. We, we, uh, there is so much going on at the league. And we realize that you're a very busy man, so thank you for taking your time tonight. One of the reasons that I wanted to, to have you on, we, we're, we've talked a lot about being on, but there's a specific reason, and that's what the ARRL has going this weekend. You're sponsoring a, a great event, uh, and uh, along with the RSGB, Radio Society of Great Britain, and the Radio Club of America. Tell us a little bit about what's going to happen Sunday. Okay, so on Sunday we are going to attempt to recreate the contact that took place on December 11th, 1921, between a station in Greenwich, Connecticut called uh, 1BCG and a station in Androsian, Scotland, 2Z Echo, manned by Paul Godley, uh, in connecting the first transatlantic shortwave transmission. Wow. Uh, 
It's really, ex let me tell you why it's exciting. And then let me tell you how this thing came to be because it's kind of quixotic as, as most good things are. Um, this is a really important event. Only 95 years ago, um, the only way you could send a message to Europe was on a boat in a letter or on the transatlantic telegraph cable. And then Marconi had his, uh, his installation, but it was very, very long wave, slow, and, and you know that better than I. But a bunch of experimenters, a bunch of people like us, just amateurs, figured there was a better way and they wanted to push the frontiers. So um, they gathered up Doc, uh, Major Edwin Armstrong, a man who invented FM and a bunch of other things, and uh, um, a local ham in Greenwich called Minton Cronkite. And they sent Paul Godley uh, uh, over to Androsian Scotland with the best super hat receiver that was available. Along the way, he met Dr. Beveridge of antenna fame, and they uh, erected a first a 1,300-foot antenna, and then they shortened it up to 800 feet. And uh, on the 21st, uh, I'm sorry, on the uh, 11th of December, 95 years ago, the first signals were received in Scotland and certified actually by the local Marconi district agent. This is an extraordinary accomplishment. These are guys just like us and their doggedness and their persistence being in the snow in Greenwich and, and poor Godley was over in Scotland in a tent and it rained most of the time he was there. He was there for several months. They just wouldn't accept failure. Um, so we're gonna be doing that. We're gonna try and make that connection and then we're gonna just open it up to a QSO party. We've got a great QSL card. It's going to bear the logos of RCA and ARRL and Radio Society of Great Britain. And the call sign over in Britain will be Paul Godley's call sign, um, uh, 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 GS2ZE. Wow. That, that is terrific, Tom. Now, Tom, what frequencies? You're probably not going to use the ones back then. Which ones will we use uh, this Sunday? Over. We're going to try for 160 on AM. We're wow. just going to try for that. And um, we've been, um, uh, we're being hosted by a local school in the area so we don't have to stand in the rain. Um, but we're <laughs> going to be, uh, we're going to be 80, 40, 20 and CW uh, sideband and, uh, and we'll attempt AM. Uh, and all of the particulars are in the ARRL letter last week and we'll resend them um, Let's see, Thursday, we'll resend in the ARRL letter. So they'll be right there, and they're in QST this month. Um, so look for us, um, join in, uh, and let's celebrate this enormous accomplishment. Uh, wow. And it's fun. It's just really fun. But if you got a minute, I'll tell you how it came to be, because it's really interesting. I think I told Bob part of the story. That's I was... Uh, I was in uh, W1HQ on a Sunday night, uh, tuning up around 75 meters, and I heard three, four guys um, uh, in a QSO on AM, and uh, I, I gotta confess, I love listening to AM. It sounds so good. It really, it sounds like broadcasting. And it, at the end of the QSO, one of the, uh, one of the uh, participants uh, was, uh, was Clark, uh, N1BCG, and so, I said to him, that's a really famous call sign. I know that call sign. Uh, got on the phone with him the next day. He told me how he was able to get the one BCG call sign and, um, and make it his own. And he's been a student of this event and early wireless experimentation in Connecticut. So I said, well, how about we got two months? How about we have a special event? He jumped on board. Radio Society of Great Britain jumped on board. Tim Duffy over at Radio Club of America jumped on board. And my masters at ARRL said, you know, let's do this. And I think it's typical of the kind of stuff that we'd like to do more of in the future. National Parks on the Air has been very successful. In fact, National Parks on the Air is just 200 QSOs short of a million. So guys, oh. get out there. Get out there, please. Sean will die if we don't get a million cues. <laughs> and, 
Anyway, so it, it all came out of a conversation on AM, and that's made us think that maybe we need an AM event. And so we're going to uh, we're going to go for an AM event sometime in the spring. We don't want to plan these things out too far. We'd like to make them more timely and build them around a historical context so people can not only operate, but they can also, you know, talk about the history of what they're operating in, the environment they're in. Wow, that that is just terrific, Tom. Well, we'll go to the higher bands, maybe 10 meters or 15, and see if we can hear you out here on six land. And Bob, you're going to be tuning in double side band, correct, Bob? I will be there. I'm there a lot. Uh, what we got? What we have to do is let the uh, let the whole fraternity know that there's still AM windows. That's been a real <laughs> problem. Uh, 3870 to 3890 and 7290 yep. to 7295. Those are windows, and and the sideband and CW ops, they need to pay attention and and let the AMers have their little window. That was a gentleman's agreement back in the 1950s. Uh, I got my license shortly after that whole thing, or shortly before all that thing took place. So I was there and 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 launched it uh, with them. So that'd be great. To, uh, to hear a, a, the ARRL and W1AW. And uh, Tommy, you, uh, uh, you, have some, uh, you have some things coming up with the bulletins too next year on AM, is that true? We do, uh, AM 40 meters. Uh, we have just been donated from another museum, a, uh, a uh, make sure I get it right, Gates Broadcast Transmitter, uh, oh, 1KW wow. Broadcast Transmitter which is going to be Bob Allison's project. Bob and a couple of other folks in the lab are going to carve it back uh, to 40 meters uh, and put it on the air. We're, we're fortunate that the transmitter is in mint condition, and it uses very inexpensive tubes. So it doesn't use the big, expensive, hard-to-find broadcast variety. And it's a plate-modulated AM transmitter. We're going to find something to do with it. I don't know whether it would be reliable enough for Joe Karsha to run bulletins on. Joe has a hard job enough over there taking uh, W1AW on the air. Um, but we will definitely put it to use, I promise you. Yeah, that'll be great. And just to be able to let people know about the about the AM activity, well, that's just great news, especially the, the parts. Is that just 200 contacts is all we need, right? Exactly, 200 for for the parks, and we'll be at a million. Uh, uh, we'll be at a million QSOs in Logbook of the World. So don't forget to put them in the Logbook of the World. But uh, exactly. uh, this has been, I mean, I have to tell you, and I thank the amateur radio community one and all for making this an incredibly successful event. Uh, not only have people had fun and gotten out of the basement and gone out on the trails and parks in America, but they've learned so much about the history of the national park system and the history of their country, of our country, in the whole process. And they've met great rangers from the National Park Service who could not be more helpful. Um, and so it's, we wish we could find another one of these and we're working on it. We're trying to, we're trying to figure out something to do. You know, it's always in any organization is what are you going to do next, right? Exactly. Well, maybe we can come up with something. By the way, uh, here's the QSL card or a copy of it that I think, uh, will be uh, out and about once uh, people get working this weekend. That'll be great. And this is going to happen Saturday on the AM, in the AM windows. So be uh, listening for the call and uh, talk to each other. Bob, Sunday. Yeah, uh, Sunday, yeah, Sunday. 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 And it, uh, it, what time? Uh, we're starting at uh, noon uh, Greenwich. Greenwich. We're starting okay. at noon Greenwich. That's great. Check the ARRL well, letter. All right. Well, I want I want you also to let people know how they can join the ARRL. They absolutely need to join the league. And uh, tell them the best, easiest way to do that because it's it's a worthwhile thing for sure. Thank you. Just just join us by going to our website, uh, ARRL.org. Uh, you can do it right online. 
uh, makes it easy for our support staff. Um, you can join at a ham fest, walk up to the ARRL booth. You can send me an email and I'll join you um, uh, or, or, or a telephone call. But it's so important um, because the league does many good things in amateur radio. Um, and in the past 10 years, you know, we fought the good fight uh, with Little Leos. We fought the good fight with Spectrum Defense. And right now we're just up to our elbows and alligators on HR 1301, which is the Amateur Radio Parity Act. And, you know, it consumes a lot of resources, but more important than resources is the support of the amateur radio community. So join that, us. We'll be grateful. That is, that is a, a, the, probably the most important thing right now because that will get a, give the amateurs a way to put up antennas where you have huge HOA problems. And uh, you're pretty close to getting that done after all these years, right? We are as close as we've ever gotten. Bob, and, and uh, it's been the um, uh, absolutely dogged work of, of Chris Imlay and uh, Hudson Division Director Mike uh, Lysenko, who have gone back and forth to Washington almost every week. Uh, if we don't make it in this uh, congressional session, we'll do it in the next one. Uh, we meet resistance sometimes from HOA people who just don't understand what the law is providing us with. It's providing hams with a seat at the table to get permission for an amateur radio antenna, which is effective. And, yes. and it gives them standing, if you know what I mean, in a legal sense. Yeah, exactly. And it, a lot of the guys don't know how much work you guys do behind the scenes, but uh, it's all here every month. There's so much stuff to read in QST and, uh, I really applaud everything you are doing, and we're happy to have new faces. And we'll uh, we'll come back and talk about some of the other things. Maybe when you hit that million mark, uh, <laughs> we'll come back and talk about all that and anything else you need. Uh, we're always here, and uh, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, being with us tonight, Tom. Bob, it's my pleasure. Anytime, Gordon, just call and I, I'll jump on Skype and we can talk. Thanks for all you do for the amateur radio community, both of you well, guys. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tom. And Tom, uh, Bob Inderbetson has talked me into and he didn't have a hard job in supporting some of the bricks that are outside of league headquarters. So you can tell Bob and you'll be seeing uh, our brick coming up shortly, maybe a couple of them. And uh, that's a great program for those that are life members of the league or just league members. Uh, look into some of the great programs that the league needs some financial help on, and you'll have your name and call on a break out front and headquarters. Is that right, Tom? That's absolutely right. And every, when I see your brick, I'm going to salute it every time I leave the office <laughs> in the afternoon. <laughs> Roger that. Tom, thank you so much for coming on board. We are honored to have you, and um, I look forward to working the 10-meter uh, ARRL contest this weekend. I'm going to listen real hard down on 75 and 160 in the double sideband mode. Who knows? Maybe all the way around the world and back again, uh, you may hear a six calling. Over. Well, over. Thank you, guys. 73s and all the best. Okay, thanks for coming, Tom. We'll uh, we'll talk to you next time and see you on AM this weekend for sure. Cheers. Okay. Wow, that was great, Bob. Bob well, I don't know how you arrange that, but the main man, new job at league headquarters, and every month I read his editorials in QST, and I sure like his philosophy. So uh, this is great news. You know, that that's one thing I should bring up. I, I, that, when I get my QST, I used to not do this because it wasn't there wasn't anything to read. But uh, about the third page in is Tom's page. And usually it, it, there was nothing there. Well, there was, but it wasn't worth reading. Tom, it just I, I can't quit reading it. I go back and read it again. Uh, he, he was an old broadcaster and. Uh, he's got his act together, and uh, we, all of us, everybody, are absolutely blessed to have Tom uh, driving his ship on this thing, and that's what the ARRL does. And uh, please go join him. It'll be the best thing you do. 
Well, we're going to move on here. I'm really apologizing for my signal tonight. I'm not in my normal space, and uh, you know how that goes. But uh, we're going to move on, and um, let's see what ICOM's got. I think they got something to tell us. Tis the season. The holidays are here. Surprise your favorite ham this season with the gift that's on their Santa list. The holidays are just around the corner, and ICOM has an array of radios to fill your stockings and place under the tree. Just arrived for the holidays, the ID518 Plus 2 provides new models for extended D-Star coverage. Available in five colors, the ID518 Plus 2 is the perfect stocking stuffer. Terminal and access mode, send and receive text messages and pictures, DV fast data mode, and easy FM repeater settings. Ideas for the contest are on the go? Try the IC7300. It's a high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design. The real fun starts here. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. Push performance to the pinnacle with the IC7600. Follow it in the footsteps of ICOM's flagship radio, the IC7600 has an intuitive operation and the latest DSP technologies. Digital IF filter, dual DSP, 5.8-inch ultra-wide TFT display, and high-resolution real-time spectrum scope. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation. Register to win for some great swag prizes like T-shirts and hats. While you're there, learn how you could win in the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. And also, we'll be giving away another one in December. It's the ICOM ID51A Plus Dual Band Dual Watch VHF UHF Handheld Transceiver does both analog and D-Star, has built-in GPS receiver, DV and FM repeater list function, independent AM FM receiver, free Android app, and a lot more. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this in each episode, get the official rules, and register to win. For November, the winner of that ID51A Plus is Mike, AA1AR. Congratulations, Mike. ICOM will be getting you one of these and your choice of colors. Uh, and like I said, there'll be another one for December. So uh, go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation this evening and register to win. Somebody's going to win. It might as well be you. Well, you know, Bob, I, I mentioned a little earlier, I had uh, uh, problems getting to a transmitter site today. One of uh, my stations well, the main transmitter failed. I was able to get the auxiliary on by remote control, and I headed out to the site. And uh, just as I pull in to where the gate is there to go through the half mile of woods to get to the tower site, there's a big tree trimming truck parked right in the middle of the road and no one any uh, anywhere around to be found. So um, that that was my exciting tale for the afternoon. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's always something that uh, wants to get in the way. This time it was a big truck. Well, I got a couple of emails here from uh, viewers out of the U.S. You know, Ham Nation is in an international show. And, uh, well, we've got just a couple here I, I wanted to go over. One was from our friend Ron, V-E-8-R-T, uh, in Canada, of course, and I'm not sure VE8, where exactly in Canada he's located, but he said, hi, George, Ham Nation was on my Roku this morning, and I think he sent this on Saturday. He says, as he woke up early making the family breakfast, it was great to see the piece on VE3 EHT, and you know, that was Emma, the, the young ham that we had on with us uh, talking last week. Uh, he said, in 1970, uh, this is Ron speaking, uh, my dad and I took our amateur radio course through the Peel Amateur Radio Club, and we passed our exams in early June of that year. Uh, we both passed our exams, and uh, Ron was issued the call sign VE3 
CZV, and his dad was issued the call sign VE3EHT, and uh, he became a silent key in 2011. And Ron said he's very happy to see that the call sign has been reissued to Emma, and uh, even better that it's back in another two generation amateur home. And he said, uh, by the way, uh, his ham household here and now. VE8LT, his XYL, uh, VE8TN, his son, and his self, VE8RT. Um, he says they all uh, wish him luck. And uh, thanks for covering that story. Well, you're welcome, Ron. You know, we always uh, like to find, uh, well, particularly, you know, young hams coming in. And uh, in this case, uh, a great story there on that call sign being reissued well you know last week um, i think it was amanda brought up a question about how we all get our antenna coaxes into the shack i've got a photo here of of how i got mine in and i've i've shown this before this is i think that's called an lb box it's an electrical box uh with a two and a half inch conduit there at the bottom of it that goes through the floor and the wall. And uh, when this picture was taken, there was only uh, one coax coming through it. And then you can see there's some other cables going out the side of it. Now that thing is full and uh, it's it's got the cover plate over it. So that's how I get my antennas into my shack here. And now uh, I want to read a story here before we go on to to the rest of the photos. This one came uh, from our friend, and, and I've been communicating with uh, Tim A here for, oh, a number of years. It is, where is his call sign? I don't have it handy here. I don't know how I missed it. But uh, Tim A is uh, in Finland, and he wanted to uh, just send me a little email here and said that the last episode that and this is not going to be the best English in the world because, um, you know, we we can converse and communicate with each other. Uh, you know, I've um, spent the last, oh, 10 or 11 years teaching people how to mispronounce words of the English language. And some of that rubbed off on him, I'm, I think. But uh, anyway, let's see if we can get to these here. He said, hello, old man George. Um, last episode of Ham Nation, you did talk about getting through wall. In coincidence, I just did uh, my main part through wall, had thinked and rethinked this subject several times, and during time, see also uh, horrible shows, even dangerous ones, and I'm not sure what he meant by that. I'm sure he wasn't talking about contamination. Anyway, he said, in um, any condition where temperatures go over and under water freezing point, their need have think while doing with, I think we know what he means there, and understand condensation moisture behavior. Another point is do assembled cables give stove distortion? And then he's got in parentheses here, something from kitchen department, QRN, QRM. And I think I know what he's talking about there. <laughs> anyway, uh, how does that look? Well, um, so there's a challenge to solve. Technical solutions are the simplest part. He says, I did made thinking and planning, finally got a hole in the wall, and he combined plumber stuff and electrical stuff. Here is a result. If we take a look at the uh, photos here, he sent several of them. The first one, and I think this is an electrical box here that uh, he took, and you can see there's a drill bit poking through it. If we go to the next shot here, we can see that uh, he took a hole saw in the back of it and he bored a hole into it. Uh, we'll have to look at the next shop because I don't remember exactly what he showed next. Okay. Then he put a um, piece of PVC conduit through it. After that, uh, well, he's showing the inside view of it here. And then he's uh, showing what it looked like with the, the cover on the end of it. I'm not real familiar with this particular fixture he's using. This is what it looked like where it came through the wall. And 
here's where it came through on the outside. You can see the PVC coming out there where he'll run his coaxes in. Here's another look after he stuffed it with insulation. And then uh, he had to do a little cleanup job. So he has his, I guess this is pronounced empty, a vacuum here cleaning up. And here's a photo from Finland. And he said, uh, 73, and uh, to all his ham friends, uh, greetings from the land of Santa Claus. So uh, that's that's my pictures of antenna wire entrances. And I know everyone else on the shows tonight got theirs coming up here shortly. So right now, Oh, who is next here? Oh, I think I got to give away something. You remember last week we had quite a controversy here. I showed an item on the show, and I asked you, what is this? And it's in a, you know, a, an optical um, glass vacuum. It looks like a tube, doesn't it? But it's not. And we pointed out that there was a set of contacts up inside of there if the camera will focus on it and I don't think it will and there's also something on the side here and I, I ask what is that it's it's not a vacuum tube well I had a lot of answers on that uh, since there's a set of contacts in there a lot of people said it was a relay and um, yeah it's a relay of sorts but that's not the answer I was looking for uh, some people said it was a vacuum relay because, you know, it's in a, a vacuum-sealed glass tube there. But no, that's not what it is. Um, but there's, if you notice that, that coil there on the side, there's really not enough turns on that thing for it to act as, um, you know, an electromagnet to pull those contacts shorted there. So it's not a regular relay. Well, I had a winner, and it was Dean Harmer. He said, uh, George, that is a time delay relay. And that's exactly what it is. I think, Bob, I think you knew what this was and yeah. what it came out of. It came, probably came out of a 30S1. At least there's one 30S1 I had. Yep, that's what it is. So that when you turn the transmitter, the filament's on, it won't allow you to turn the B plus on. You got to wait about three or four minutes because the tubes won't take all of that at the same time. You got to turn on the high voltage a few minutes later. And so they put this time delay in there. And when you turn everything on a few minutes later, bingo, the red light comes on and you're ready to go. That's exactly what it is. This one came out of a, a 2.5 kilowatt Gates FM transmitter. And, uh, yeah, you know, if you turn on the filaments on, um, on, on most tubes, not all, but on most tubes, if you turn on the filaments and immediately turn on plate voltage, you're going to poison the filaments and you're not going to get the life out of that tube that you should. And uh, this prevents you from doing that. It, um, it, it times out. Those contacts have to close before you're able to energize the plate or um, the B+. Plus as Bob said there. And uh, so it prevents you from doing that. It also prevents you from going on the air when that coil in there opens up and uh, it can no longer heat up those contacts and make them touch. So I replace this with a, um, a modern solid state replacement part, but uh, that's, that's what it is. And uh, uh, Dean, we're going to be sending you an MFJ 148 RC. Nice, Radio control clock from MFJ will do display in both 12 and 24 hours. You've got one side you can set for your local time. You can set the other side for uh, UTC. It's also got a built-in 10-minute ID timer on it, and it synchronizes itself with WWV. So uh, what could you more could you ask for in a shack clock? For next week, I've got, um, well, we're going to do another what is it? And this is another one of those. I know Bob is going to know exactly what it is. And there ought to be a lot of you that do. I want to know what it is and uh, and what its primary use is. 
it's just it's not much to this it's just a, a little piece of metal there with a tab on it it's got threads on it and there's a little hole in the end of it there Bob I think uh, you probably know what this is don't you Don't see very many of them anymore, though. You don't see many anymore. Yep. But uh, if you got some old gear, you might see one of these on it. Or, uh, and that's all I can say. I, I can't specify what kind of gear. So if you think you know what that is, send your answer to me, um, hamnationcontest at gmail.com. We've got another one of these great DX Engineering canvas tote bags. Uh, we've given these away before. They are really fine, heavy duty. These are not like those shopping bags that uh, you see at the department stores or the grocery stores. This is a nice, heavy canvas bag, perfect for hauling your uh, coax or uh, whatever you need to haul around your ham gear. This is a perfect companion to do it with. Ham Nation Contest at gmail.com. Tell me what this is and Hey, you could win that canvas tote bag. Okay, now let's get Dale in here with this week's Show Me Your Shack. Well, thank you, George. Thank you uh, very much. i tell you what, uh, somebody uh, left the air conditioning on up here. It uh, is cold. We're down to around uh, 22 degrees and clear skies, which means it's going to go down in the teens or less overnight and uh gonna be cold wind chill down around zero this morning so that's that that's the weather report from the k0hyd weather station but tonight on this 75th anniversary of the attack on pearl harbor uh that was uh dale minus 15 days <laughs> wasn't even here yet but uh we've got two videos for you tonight one's information packed the other seasonal, I think you'll really enjoy the seasonal video, but uh, we'll go uh, right on and get moving here. We've had many requests during the past year for a video describing the software available for hams that they can run on an iPhone or an iPad. And right on schedule, Dan stepped up, N9LVS, the wiki editor here at Ham Nation. He came through, a nice video. A lot of information, and here's Dan with a listing of the most popular iOS apps for amateur radio operators. This is Apple iOS Apps for Amateur Radio. In this video, we're going to talk about apps that you can use for your iOS device. This is the iTunes Store. As you can see when we look up amateur radio, there are a lot more apps available. Let's start out with Hamtest Prep. This is a study guide application that gives you a full list of questions in the question pool. From the main menu, you can also take practice exams or see your test history. It also gives you a complete breakdown of Part 97. When you take a practice exam, it'll look like this. And when you've completed your exam, you'll get a nice proficiency percentage from the exam. Next, let's look at QRZ for Apple. When we look up W1AW, we get all the information we'd expect to see from the standard QRZ page. We can also see its location. And if we want, we can actually see a standard QRZ page. Then there's Repeater Book, a nice little application that finds repeaters that are close to you. For instance, the AH6LE repeater is only 0.9 miles away. And as we scroll down the list, we see that the N7ASM repeater is only 4.8 miles away. If we click on the repeater listing, we get all the particulars about that repeater. There's also filters that we can select which repeaters we will see, as well as which modes we want to use. You can also set auto location. That way you only see the repeaters that are nearest to you. We also have OpenAPRS, a nice little APRS app. From the main screen on the app, it gives you a working compass, as well as access to all the app's features. This area here gives you exact location, as well as some of the setup features. We can also do a search and see when the last time one of our fellow hams was on, as well as the ability to message back and forth. We're also able to look people up on a map as well. There's also an Echolink app. This is very similar to what you'd see on your desktop. First thing that you're going to want to do is make sure that the connection to Echolink is working. All you have to do is log into the test server and then transmit some audio and listen to it back. Then, while well, you need to pick a country that you want to talk to. From that list, you'll see everybody in that country that's on Echolink. Once you've connected, you'll get a screen that looks like this. This tells you everybody that's on that node. Then all you have to do is click transmit and you're in the conversation. 
And let's not forget iCluster, a neat little app to catch spots on the DX cluster. From the main page, you'll see all the current DX spots and who sent that spot. If you click on one of the spots, you'll come up to this page, which gives the spotting details, as well as the information from the herd station. You can also connect to numerous different DX clusters. There's also an area for alerts and filters. You can filter by band, by mode, by zone, and by call. This app also has a very nice link to QRZ. And last but not least, Ham Antenna Calculator for iOS. This antenna app is set up to work either English or metric and can calculate 8th wave, quarter wave, half wave, 5 eighths wave, or a full wave antenna. You just punch in your frequency and it comes up with the length. In this case, for a dipole, it's telling us what a half wave length is and what a quarter wave length is. It can do the same for the inverted V, where it calculates the inverted V for either 20 degrees, 32 degrees, or 45 degrees, as well as calculating for a vertical, where it gives our vertical length as well as our radial length. The iTunes App Store has a lot of amateur radio apps that are available. This video is just to give you a quick look at what's available for ham radio in the App Store. I hope this video has been helpful. And 7 threes from N9 LVS. Well, thanks, Dan. We appreciate that excellent research from the Apple App Store and the iOS apps. There are many, many more amateur radio apps out there, too, in the App Store. Uh, more added every day, I believe. So you might want to check it out if you have uh, one of those phones or uh, one of those uh, tablets. Well, it's only 18 days now to Christmas, and uh, you'll need to wait for that new rig under the tree yourself. But uh, the children out there can talk to Santa right now, courtesy of SantaNet 2016. Well, Larry, WD0AKX, produced a longer video for his YouTube channel as he listened in on the net control station while he was talking to Santa. Larry also gave us permission to prepare a trailer for presentation here on Ham Nation. Hi, everyone. Larry, WD0AKX. Just want to throw out a quick reminder to some of you again this year. It's that time of year. Christmas is coming. It's the Santa Net going on right now until Christmas on 3916 kilohertz. The Santa Net. You can find it by just Googling uh, Santa Net 2016 or 3916 Santa Net, and you'll find the Tailgaters site with all the information you need. If you have some kids or grandkids or neighbor kids that want to talk to Santa, this is a perfect time. Get them on the radio and you, they can talk directly to Santa at the North Pole. And I'll give you a few examples of what's going on tonight here. Let's check it out. CQ Santa, this is the 3916 Santa Net every night at this time connecting good boys and good girls with the North Pole and Santa Claus. This is KE5 GGY Pete. I'm in Denton County, just north of Dallas, Texas. I'll be your net control station for tonight's edition of the Santa Net. Joining me tonight are Santa Net relay stations. These are the stations that are strategically positioned throughout North America that have the important role of relaying in the voice of Santa to the children that check in tonight. Come in, Santa. That's kind of how it goes. 3916 kilohertz every night at 7:30 p.m. Central Time from now up through Christmas. Get on the air with your kids and have some fun. 73WD0AKX. If you've got children, you definitely need to get them on your radio and let them talk to Santa right there on 3916. Larry, thanks for the promo. We appreciate it. Uh, for those that would like to see the entire longer uh, video from the Santa Net, check out Larry's YouTube page.
Well, with your help and a few timely submissions, we'll be back on the eve of my 75th birthday with another video segment here on Ham Nation. I might even uh, need to wear the Santa hat uh, that night because it's uh, going to be uh, the 21st, I believe, of uh, December. Before we can do that, though, we need to get your video. We're pretty low on videos right now, so I'd like to have you submit one. Send a link along with any backstory to Ham Nation videos at TWIT.TV. And don't forget, uh, we need you to send your shack photos too so we can build another episode of Show Me Your Shack. Lester has been in the hospital this week, so I didn't get a chance to get outside and grab a fancy shot of uh, my coax entry. It's not too fancy, but it uh, works. I'll give you a description. I'll show you a picture of the inside. Uh, would look something like this if we get it in the right position here. And uh, basically what we did is we just took, uh, well, it's about a two-inch, uh, two-and-a-half-inch uh, PVC elbow uh, used to take PVC conduit around the corner and we just put it in uh, the wall with uh, the uh, openings facing down. So it's like almost a U, but not quite a U. Uh, outside, uh, the opening is also facing down. So any uh, water running down the feed lines would then uh, run on off the cable and not run uphill uh, into the house over the top of that U. So... Uh, that's how we did that, and uh, also uh, for our 160-meter off-center fed dipole and uh, for our receive antennas, uh, basically we've got one of those MFJ window antenna feed-through panels, and uh, they're very handy, highly recommended. Uh, that way you don't have to uh, drill any holes in the side of the house or in the ceiling or anything else. So that's uh, what we do here. Uh, Amanda's going to have a whole bunch of them a little bit later. And that's it for the video segment. Don has Newsline next. But uh, first, we need to find out uh, what's in that uh, DX engineering calendar he's uh, reading. Love those DX antennas. Go ahead, Don. There's all kinds of stuff in here, Dale. Stuff to, like you said, to bring your coax in. And mine is, uh, mine is a temporary... Uh, hi, everybody. Mine's a temporary uh, setup that I actually uh, did about seven years ago, and it's still exactly the way it is. I won't bore you with a picture. It just comes straight in that window right there. It's, it's a little drafty in here because of that, but uh, one of these days I'll I'll get around to putting my my permanent tower up, and then I'll, I'll do it the right way. But for now, it works. And, uh, you know, as long as you can get your wire outside some way, to your antenna so you can get your signal out. Well, that's really all that's important after all, isn't it? And it's contest season, so you can count on these guys right here at DX Engineering to outfit your shack so you can rack up the multipliers, snag some rare contacts, put some wallpaper on the wall, a handful of new DX Engineering products that will help you secure your place in the contest leaderboards. The NCC2 improves upon DX Engineering's popular NCC1 Receive Antenna Variable Phasing Controller. Combines the NCC1 phase controller and the RTR1A, or as we say down here in New Orleans, the RTR1A, receive antenna interface technologies, all into one box that allows you to phase transmit and receive antennas more easily. It's a great feature if you've got the space uh, constraints on your property, not a lot of space. It's, uh, it's an easy way to do that. The NCC2 gives you enhanced balance functionality that increases the ability to vary the phasing between the two different types of antennas. You can now expand the NCC2's versatility with the new internal slots for plug-in modules versions of the DX Engineering Receive Guard and the RPA Series Preamplifier. Also, the new RTR2 takes advantage of these new plug-in expansion slots as well. And the Receive Antenna Interface is a great solution if you want to add a separate Receive Antenna, even if your radio doesn't have a dedicated Receive Antenna port. Really good for interfacing antennas and multiple radios. And it simplifies interconnections, three internal slots for the plug-in modules. These include, like we said, the Engineering Receiver Guard 5000 HD and the new RPA2 Receive Preamplifier. And uh, even a module that adapts to your 75-ohm uh, feed line to a 50-ohm receiver input impedance, if you've got that 
need. You can also go hands-free with DX Engineering's foot switches. If you've not used a foot switch, you're going to, oh man, especially if you're doing a lot of logging, you need to have your hands free. The new Push to Talk foot switches give you an excellent combination of performance and value. There are, uh, there are three different models, and each one made to DX Engineering's rigid manufacturing specs, better quality than most others on the, uh, on the market. Like I said, three of them. Budget-friendly plastic version, a near-bulletproof cast iron version, or a cast iron switch with an extra wide foot pedal if you have an extra wide foot, or even if you don't. It's perfect for enthusiastic stomps. And who doesn't like an enthusiastic stomp now and then? DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. In fact, they stomp everybody else with their shipping. <laughs> See what I did there? If you get your order in by 10 p.m. Eastern, it fits in stock. It'll be on a trek headed your way tonight. Proven products, expert advice. DX Engineering helps you shrink the globe. Request your catalog or shop online 24-7 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. We do thank them for their support here of Ham Nation. Great folks. And if you haven't ordered from DX Engineering, well, there's something wrong with it. I don't want you in the house. Why don't we go now to the news of the week from Amateur Radio Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline report number 2040. These are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, December 7th, 2016. Deadly wildfires are in the news again, consuming hundreds of buildings in and near eastern Tennessee's resort towns of Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge. Jim Dameron, N8TMW, picks up the story. While no ham operators were asked to step in and assist local authorities, hams have been helping with communications at American Red Cross shelters housing evacuees. Keith Miller, N9DGK, the Tennessee section manager for the ARRL, told Amateur Radio Newsline in an email that amateurs were specifically advised not to self-deploy, but simply to remain vigilant in case the situation changes. Amateur Radio Newsline will follow this story and post any updates on our Facebook page and in our Twitter feed. There's an essay contest geared to young hams. In 500 words or less, can you sum up your feelings about amateur radio, what it means to you, and what your hopes are for your future on the air? If you're between 12 and 18 years of age, a resident of one of the 48 contiguous United States, and are licensed as a technician or higher, it might just pay to put some of your thoughts on paper. The Dave Calter Youth DX Adventure is running an essay contest for a complete ham station, and the youngster whose words capture the judge's attention most will end up with a nicely equipped shack. The prize includes an Alinco SR8T HF radio, a Jetstream 12-volt 30-amp power supply or equivalent, a Jetstream JTV680 vertical antenna or equivalent, and 100 feet of coax feed line fitted with PL259 connectors. The co-founders of the DX Youth Adventure and this year's raffle winner, Paul Ewing, N6PSE, are the generous donors behind this competition. There's bound to be a pileup, so act fast. Postal mail entries or email entries should be either postmarked or electronically dated by midnight of December 23rd. For rules and an entry form, visit qsl.net slash n6jrl. Winners will be announced by January 31st. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Heather Emby, KB3TZD. December 7th, 1941. Pearl Harbor Day, and Amateur Radio was marking the day that, as President Franklin Delano Roosevelt stated, will live in infamy with several special events. Here's but one. Members of the Tri-State Amateur Radio Association in Huntington, West Virginia, are honoring the noted World War II battleship, the USS West Virginia. The ship sustained severe damage at Pearl Harbor, where it was among those ships struck by aerial torpedoes and bombs dropped by Japanese aircraft on December 7, 1941. The damage ultimately caused the ship to sink to the harbor bottom, but she was eventually raised and put into dry dock for repair and did return to service in the Pacific, including the Battle of Leyte Gulf, Iwo Jima, Jima, and Okinawa, as well as being one of the ships sent to secure the Japanese surrender in Tokyo Bay in 1945. Taking pride in this namesake ship, W8VA will operate on 20 and 40 meters on Saturday, December 10, between 1500 and 2300 UTC. Special QSL cards will be available. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Mike Askins, KE5CXP. As we remember the events of December 7th, 1941, Amateur Radio Newsline has a special extended report on three hams who have first-hand knowledge of that fateful day. We invite you to give it a listen. There aren't many World War II or Pearl Harbor veterans left, let alone those who are hams. So this report is a special treasure. 
And for the rest of this week's Amateur Radio News, please listen to the full Amateur Radio Newsline report online on a repeater near you or on shortwave radio station WTWW at 99.30 and 50.85 kilohertz. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at www.arnewsline.org. With Jim Dameron, N8TMW, Heather Emby, KB3TZD, Mike Askins, KE5CXP, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe, I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. And, you know, speaking of shortwave radio station WTWW, we are on 5085 tonight, as we always simulcast Ham Nation. But we are additionally on another frequency from WTWW, and that is 12.105. 12.105, which has huge, huge coverage into Africa. So if you're watching us, I saw someone on the, uh, on the chat room mention they were in the Netherlands and they were hearing it over there. So if you're listening to us on 12.105, on WTWW, please go to the uh, newsline, uh, well, the newsline, the Ham Nation on Twit uh, TV Facebook page. Just go to Facebook and search for Ham Nation on Twit, and you'll find us. Uh, put a note in the in the Facebook page if you're listening to us from over there on 12.105 on WTWW. It's it's a flamethrower. It's hot. It's almost as hot as Val. Val's got some video for us. So this is what we have at our shack. It's uh, an eight-hole entry panel. And then here's a look at it from the inside. And uh, the best thing to do once you, if you, there's room in there so you don't get critters, is uh, put some, shove some steel wool in there. Rats and mice uh, can't chew through that. So we get ours from SitePro1.com, the, the aluminum entry panels. They're all standard. They're about four inches the holes are and then you can also get caps for them so don't necessarily order for what you have now but what you may have down the road you can also order from sitepro1.com the rubber boot assembly which is really nice now Jerry also uses the threaded tube entry on a lot of commercial applications but it works great in the home as well um, it's one foot eight inches long so it can come into your shack and the two ends are threaded so you can unscrew that push that through and then screw it back on so that works nice now when I started out this is what I did uh, I just shoved the coax through the window and uh, closed it as tight as I could but DX engineering actually sells the Comet window feed through jumpers which is great if you only have one line of coax coming into the shack now if you have more than one look at the MFJ universal window feed through panels uh, where you connect them at the back and then you have jumpers running uh, from the front to your radio now, I actually know some hams that use simple dryer vents. They're very inexpensive and work great. I need something like that to tidy up my seven-year temporary installation. <laughs> Good stuff, Val. <laughs> Thanks. Something, something else I need. Um, there's a new Twit Army t-shirt and hoodie. Twit Army gear. Designed by the Twit staff, come in a variety of colors. If you order before December 15th, the shirts will arrive before Christmas. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Teespring.com uh, slash Twit. Uh, Brian probably has a lower third with that on there. Teespring.com slash Twit for, your, uh, for your, your Twit Army gear. And also, they're working on best of episodes for all the shows on Twit. If you have one, go to twit.tv slash best of. Submit your favorite moment of 2016. Uh, and uh, you'll look really sharp in your Twit Army T-shirt while you're submitting your, your favorite moment of 2016. Of course, you have to order your Twit Army T-shirt first, but nonetheless, you can do it shirtless if you would like, although I wouldn't recommend that for some people. Um, let's go and see what's going on in the chat room now with Amanda. Well, good evening, and uh, I have some pictures to show of my shack too. Guess what? Don, I'm afraid that you said yours is a seven-year temporary. I'm afraid that ours is going to end up being the seven-year temporary. We do. This is first. This is our bus bar, which is outside right now because we do have some rearrangements to make in the shack. So this is where we have to go outside to change our antennas and to, to plug them in and stuff. But, you know, it works for right now. So that's not a big deal. Oh, and Jeff has comments. What? Oh, he Give that man a microphone. That Give that man a microphone. Go ahead, Jeff. You're actually going to put me on the show. I, I, I want to leave it there because if we take a strike, I want it to be outside and not inside or on the side of the house. So my my intent was to leave it. 
That's a good so, idea. That is our intent to leave it. Colorado does have a lot of lightning strikes uh, yeah. closest to Florida and maybe some others. This is the temporary part. This is where yeah. it's not so pretty and it's going into our garage, which then goes into our ham shack slash laundry room. The laundry room part's going to be taken out. So we don't even want to show that because it's not really all that pretty, but a, it keeps the critters out for right now. Just really embarrassed you guys. So, but you know what? It works. And um, yes, we would like to have a permanent hole with some PVC in a nice entryway, but thanks, Brian. Could you really get a closer up look of the expanding foam? Thanks, we appreciate that. That was, that was ugly. I liked it. <laughs> it's very ugly. It, ah. it reminds me of something Don would do. Ugly works. Ugly works. I said that out loud. So that's what we've got going on here. You guys, it doesn't always have to be pretty. It just needs to work, right? And uh, nice. make sure the mice aren't going to get in. You know, spiders, whatever, they're going to get in under the garage door anyway. So it doesn't really matter, but keep everyone happy. Um, okay, so I had a couple of questions here. Uh, we had a lot of questions for Tom. I really wish he could have stuck around for that. That would have been really cool, but it was really nice to have him on tonight. Thank you, Tom, if you're still watching. And... Um, so the first question, Bob, comes from uh, Web1572. He wants to know if you've ever worked with the Trans-Siberian Orchestra for putting on their shows, and if not, maybe they should start thinking about some Heil microphones for their uh, production. Yep. They got a few. I don't know exactly uh, how long it's been, but uh, they do use, uh, use those. There's several of those Christmas shows running around that uh, use our stuff, and we're very happy and proud to, uh, to help them. Mostly very all good. PR Mostly all PR 30s. By the way, there's some pictures on my coax entrance when you get ready. Uh, Brian's got them. Let's go over it. I'm sorry. I thought you had already showed them. Uh, let's see them, Bob. Okay. This is the room when I first uh, got into the house. We tripped the carpet up. And uh, the next picture will show you close-ups of those. I've, I told you before, we use toilet flanges. They really work well. And uh, we put those down and then the, put the tile on. And uh, this brings the, uh, uh, the coax up and into the switch box, which is behind the console. And out, outside, they, there's 15 coaxes that go out and we go under wow. the driveway. And then uh, this is what happens outside. This is important also. This is an irrigation cover. Uh, they make them for irrigation valves. And the black part, uh, I have that buried and then that's a waterproof seal on top. It really works great uh, to make any kind of uh, moves outside. And I've been using them for, what, five years now, and it works great. But the toilet flange thing is a, is a terrific, easy way uh, to do it. It doesn't cost very much to do it. So I thought we'd let you know about that. Well, thank you, Bob. And that uh, gives us... Sorry, I was sharing the mic or the earphones here with uh, Jeff so he could hear as well. It gives everybody kind of some options of what's available. And it tells you, A, it can be ugly if it works. B, it can be awesome, but be a toilet flange. I mean, these are some great ideas. And I hope it keeps everyone um, ready to uh, move forward with installing more stuff into their shack. So appreciate that, Bob, very much. A couple other things I had. I didn't have any announcements tonight. There must not be many ham in December, thinking for other reasons. Um, Ricardo, I'm going to answer your question for you. It says, could you please ask Gordon, I'm interested in the Instructor Academy at the Orlando Hamcation. Do I need to register? If so, where? Uh, as long as the room is open, Gordo will let you in. Um, but de definitely, as soon as you get there, if you don't find out online, uh, contact, find Gordo because he's always in um, he's always in the area somewhere. But find him and ask him what they're... Uh, regulations are and letting you in that uh, um, academy instructor class. So uh, good luck with that and have fun in Hamcation, of course. Other than that, you guys, I didn't have any other questions. It's been a wonderful show. It was great to have Tom on here. Uh, just the Nets, uh, 7180 I know is going on, 20 meters, no go, and 14 Charlie for the D-Star net. And uh, do drop in for the Echo Link net. So, Bob, I'll send it back to you. All right. Well, it has been a great show, and I'm happy that we could have Tom on, and that's the first of many. He was uh, he was very uh, very agreeable to, to coming on. Uh, he and I uh, go back uh, about the same years <laughs> started in this hobby 
we were talking about green leaf punches and building things. And so I think, I think we'll get a thing together and Tom and I will put something together. Uh, that ought to be fun. But uh, in the meantime, we have a weekend on AM. So uh, we'll see you there. 38, write this down. The AM window is 3870 to 3890. You don't use sideband, CW, RIDI, anything. You share that with the AM operators. They don't come down and get into the rest of it. And that's just a gentleman's agreement. It's not set up by any one entity except the uh, AM operators. Because we know that uh, their signals get a little wide once in a while. So we just stay right there. 7290 to 7295. But that's not to say you won't see them way down on the low end sometimes. We've been seeing if there's no activity down there. But we'll see you there. So it looks like going to be a good weekend. 10 meters uh, AM contest will be great. You want to go up and um, all the technicians can uh, be on AM. They can be on sideband. They can be on CW. So we'll catch up with you on 10 meters also. So have fun this weekend. We'll be back home uh, after Friday. And um, our signal would be better. The, uh, I'm amazed. This is a cable signal, and it's not good tonight. I knew no way. 7-3, everybody. Stay in touch. Stay safe. Have fun. Keep the tubes lit because your shack will be warmer. Katie told me that. Katie told me that. <laughs> so she until next it. time, <laughs> do what? She needs it. She needs the heat. Did you see how much snow she had, Bob? It yeah. Uh -huh. cars. I mean, it was like 12 inches. So yeah, they need it. stuff we don't want to see <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> okay, everybody. And uh, let's see, uh, there's going to be, um, uh, we always forget to talk about, at least I do. And we don't mention that if you can't get on D-Star, if you don't have equipment, you can go to Ham Nation D-Star, all one word. Ham Nation D Star, no spaces, dot net. And uh, you can uh, listen in. So there you go. They're going to be on 14C, I think. Is that right, George? Is that where they are tonight? Yes, 14, Charlie. And uh, the Echo Link is uh, Star Do Drop in Star or node number 355800. Now, if we have that app for our iPhone, we can check in there, right? You can. You can. That's a very easy way to do it. I need to do that. I really do. Okay, everybody, good night. And, uh, boy, starting to be a great season. Oh, on Saturday night, go over to the big WTWW at 8 o'clock Central. We're uh, doing some, starting to do Christmas music each Saturday night. Uh, so it's Theater Organ, Neo's Arcs on the shortwave TWTWW. And we're very happy to do that. It takes a lot of, a lot of time, but we're uh, we're very happy to uh, to play music for everybody, especially Christmas music. So we'll see you then. You guys all take care. Bye bye for now. Bye.